we all looked at this from a lens of do these things so you can rank high in Google. Well, if you do these things and have really good, helpful pages, that's going to increase your leads too. You're going to get more people calling your website, fewer people jumping off your website. So not only can you get more traffic, but you'll probably get more leads from that traffic. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Sprinkler Nerd Show. I'm your host, Andy Humphrey, and today I have another special guest for you on the topic of digital marketing and specifically search engine optimization. Today I have my good friend, Jeff Oxford. He is the president and founder of 180 Marketing. That's 180marketing.com. And I personally hired Jeff to work on my websites. And within the last year, he was able to increase our organic search traffic by 20%. And I'm extremely happy about that. Now, Jeff works specifically with e-commerce businesses. So I don't have Jeff on the show to solicit your business as a landscape or irrigation professional. But I do think that we all get so busy, wrapped up in our day-to-day -day and fixing sprinklers and installing projects and bidding and estimating that we tend to sometimes leave our website off to the side. So I wanted to bring Jeff on the show to talk about search engine optimization 101, some things that you can do to increase your search rankings and also to talk a little bit about where search is going and some things that you can do right now to prepare your company for the next few years. So without further ado, let's jump right in. If you are an irrigation professional, old or new, who designs, installs, or maintains high-end residential, commercial, or municipal properties, and you want to use technology to improve your business, to get a leg up on your competition, even if you're an old school irrigator from the days of hydraulic systems, this show is for you. Jeff, welcome to the Sprinkler Nerd Show. So glad to have you today. Thanks for having me, Andy. Yeah, this is going to be fun because I'm looking to increase the diversity of content and I've already had a couple marketing related episodes. And one of the things that affects all digital marketing is search engine optimization. And you and I have a pre-existing relationship through e-commerce and SEO for e-commerce and some of the work that you've done for us. And so I thought it would be good to bring you on the show and kind of talk SEO 101 and some of the things that a small business owner can be thinking about. So why don't we just start by giving us a little bit about your background, who you are, what you do, and how you got started. Sure. Well, I've been doing SEO for about 10 years now. I first got into it when my dad, who had a, a marketing agency, he was doing all the old school logos, websites, and this whole thing of SEO was emerging. I didn't really know how to do it. So he said, Jeff, go learn this. And that's kind of where it all started. And from there, I worked for multiple agencies before starting my own agency back in 2013. That's 180 Marketing. You know, we used to work with all types of clients. Now we mainly just work with e-commerce types websites, but the foundational principles are the same. Whatever works for e-commerce is going to work for just about any website. Okay, fantastic. And when you were just out there and you said, I'm going to start learning about SEO, what were some of the first things you did to discover and learn about the search engine optimization business? Yeah, that's a question that comes up a lot. People aren't really sure, like, how do you learn SEO? Do you go to university for it? Do you major in SEO? Well, there's not really any majors or course curriculum in search engine optimization for good reason. It's changing all the time. And by the time a textbook's written, it's already outdated. So the best places that I learn is just online looking at you know, reliable blogs. But as you're learning SEO, one thing that can be frustrating is you're going through all these different sources and sometimes you'll get contradicting information. So it's important or at least very helpful when you're learning to find like a few really trusted sources of SEO information. And the top blogs that I'd recommend if somebody is listening and they want to learn SEO would mm -hmm. be backlinko.com. That's B-A-C-K-L-I-N-K-O.com. Is that Brian's website? That's Brian's website, yeah. Okay. Really good resource for on-page SEO, link building, pretty much anything you need to succeed in SEO. Another great resource that I love is hrefs.com, A-H-R-E-F-S. Hrefs is one of the leading SEO tools. It's my favorite SEO tool, and they do a lot of content marketing. They also have a lot of YouTube videos to support their content. 
So between those two sources, if you dive into that for a few hours, uh, you're going to be way ahead of a lot of people. Awesome. And I think I'll provide a little bit of background. So you and I met through the e-commerce fuel, what I call the owners group for e-commerce store owners. And you had given a presentation, was amazing. And I think what I liked the most is that you did a real world sort of website teardown. So you got examples from the crowd of their websites, and then you went in with Ahrefs and a couple of their tools and broke it down. And for me, that was a sign of, okay, this guy isn't just selling SEO services. This guy knows what he's talking about. So if I hire him, I immediately felt like I knew what I was going to get. And I knew that you were going to be able to help. And I'm happy to report that one year after hiring you, I just looked this morning and our web traffic that we track weekly is up 20% over a year ago before you started. That's great. Your efforts have really paid off in terms of traffic. That's awesome. And it, it all kind of goes down to the SEO fundamentals. You know, find whatever keyword that you want to rank for and then optimize your web page for it. And, you know, you can do that by putting your keyword in the title tag, put your keyword in the meta description, put your keyword in the header tag. You also want to put your keyword within the content. So if you're trying to rank for Los Angeles landscaping services and that's your keyword that people are searching for, you'll probably want to put that in those places, title tag, uh, meta description, header tag. And the header tag is it's usually the title that's displayed on the page. And then, you know, mention it once or a few times in the content. And that just those few things can get you to rank pretty well. Okay. That's great feedback. With that in mind, are there a couple things that you're seeing that work well right now? I'd say the things that work most that we've seen the most impact with is content and links. And when I say content, it's really just answering the person's question. If they're searching for mm. Los Angeles landscaping, what are they looking for? What do they expect to see? What do they want on that page? I'm guessing they're probably going to want maybe some information on prices. They probably want to maybe information on which specific parts of Los Angeles. Is it, you know, the whole area? Is it maybe just a certain sections of the city? They might want to know what services are available. So if you can present it in a really easy way and also build trust, you know, why should they go with you over somebody else? Having maybe a video about who we are and, and why work with us. Your goal is to prevent somebody from feel like they need to hit the back button. You want to be the end stop for their search and answer their question. Everything I said doesn't really tie in as much to the technical side of SEO, but that's kind of where Google's going. Their main goal is to serve somebody the most relevant and helpful information possible. And if you can do that by having things like testimonials on your page, a really easy way for them to contact you, that can go a long way. Okay. I heard you say what stood out in my mind was prevent the user from hitting the back button. What kind of a signal or does that send a signal to Google? So what's interesting is Google's actually looking at what we call click-through rates and bounce rates to see who ranks where. So if, let's say there's a website that has a really bad web page. They don't have a lot of information. The website looks old and dated. It loads really slow. If people are coming to that page and then hitting the back button, Google's going to see that as a, a signal that, hey, people don't like this website. We shouldn't rank this as high. And that page over time will slowly start to go lower and lower and lower in rankings until it's not even on page one. And the flip side is also possible. It's also very true. If you have a web page that's getting really high engagement where people are coming to that page and staying on that page and Google sees that over the course of hundreds or thousands of visitors, that page is going to start ranking well. Even if they don't have all the you know, SEO best practices in place, if they have really good content that answers that query, that can get them to rank at the top of search engines. Gotcha. So it's sort of maybe a two part. You can get that traffic using some content and meta information that we've talked about. But then if you drive that visit to your website and they hit the back button and let's say 90% of people hit that back button, you could have ranked on the first page, but over time, Google's going to look at that and say, hey, this page mm -hmm. is not popular. People do not like this page because they're not staying. So let's move it down ranking. And I think what I heard you say is it can be the other way. If your traffic is, let's say, sort of slow, however, 90% of the people land and then they click to page two or page three or page four, you're sending a message to Google that says people like this page. Mm -hmm. Let's increase it because they're staying on it. That's exactly it. 
let's use like, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with winterization services because I just moved to a, a cold climate place over in Oregon. You know, I, I was doing my search and, you know, I found winterization is pretty cheap, maybe like $75 and they'll, they'll blow out your sprinklers for you. But imagine if someone's searching and they come to a page, it's perfectly optimized for the term Seattle winterization or whatever it is. You could be perfectly optimized. You could have that keyword everywhere, have the, the ideal keyword density. But if your price is 500 for winterization and your competitors are only 100, it doesn't matter how well optimized your page is, you're not going to rank very well because mm -hmm. people are probably going to hit the back button a lot. Right. Or maybe you don't have the price at all. So I guess yeah. you want to make sure you know what they're looking for. So if they land on the page, what is it that they're, they're thinking about when they ran that search, they landed on that page. Did you serve them up what they were looking for? And it could go two ways. Number one, they could be looking for how to winterize a system. And perhaps that mm -hmm. search word phrase could be different than if they're looking to find a price, then they might want to see a price. And if you're listening and you're afraid to give a price, because we all know that a two zone irrigation system is different than a 20 or a hundred zone irrigation system, perhaps you could do, and I'm just thinking out loud, maybe do a price breakdown or talk about what affects the price of a winterization so that that visitor finds what they were looking for, and then they can learn a little bit more and perhaps visit the next page or the page after that talking about winterization and the cost of winterization. Yeah, exactly. You can get pretty advanced with it, make it super user friendly. Maybe you have some images just kind of showing different size houses and yards and, you know, kind of just providing ranges. So if someone who's coming has at least a rough idea and they're compelled to pick up the phone and call and they're not going to hit that back button. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's say there's somebody listening today and they're in the process of starting a business, or they know they want to start a business in the next six months, obviously on their list of things to do, it's going to be launch my company website. And are there simple steps that a new website should go through when they first launch? Yeah, I'd say that the first thing you want to do is see what are my customers searching for? You know, there's paid tools for this. If you have the budget for it, I'd highly recommend hrefs.com. That's A-H-R-E-F-S, what we talked about earlier. That has everything you need to be uh, successful, but it's also a bit of overkill. You're not going to need probably 80% of the tools and capabilities they have. So if you just want to dip your toe into it, there's a great tool called Uber Suggest. This is on Neil Patel's website, who's a very good online marketer, well-known. And Uber suggests a free keyword research tool. So you can just go in and put maybe things like, you know, what, whatever your services are and append your city. So if you're in Los Angeles, uh, Andy, what are some of the different services that somebody would offer? Well, somebody could offer new installation mm -hmm. and that can be new installation for residential or commercial or municipal type systems. Mm -hmm. They can offer uh, service and repair. And again, that would be residential service or commercial service. They can offer, as you mentioned, uh, winterizations. And they can also offer general or regular maintenance, which is different than repair. Mm -hmm. So a weekly visit, uh, monthly visits, et cetera. Great. So you can go into this tool and just put in some general keywords, you know, Los Angeles landscaping installation, Los Angeles landscaping repair. Los Angeles sprinkler installation, Los Angeles sprinkler repair, and so on. So you just kind of start doing some data mining, put some of your keywords in there and see what's it coming back with. And what's good about this type of tool is it's going to tell you exactly how many times people are searching for these keywords each month. So you know which keywords you need to focus on. Maybe you, you consider it landscaping services, but you find people aren't really searching that keyword. Instead, they're searching maybe uh, sprinkler services. So you want to know exactly what are people searching for and find your target keywords. So that's the first step. So now you, you have your different keywords. In doing this, you might also want to try other geographical areas. Maybe instead of Los Angeles, maybe you do Beverly Hills, Malibu, Santa Monica. Maybe you start doing individual regions. See, are, are people searching just for the greater Los Angeles County, or are they actually looking for specific local areas? And from there, you can see, you know, you have your list of keywords. Now you got to make sure you know where you're going to target those keywords. It can be really hard to target so many different keywords on one page. If someone's looking for, 
sprinkler services in Santa Monica, you know, they might want to see something different than someone searching sprinkler services in, in another part of town, you know, Beverly Hills. So, you know, having a different page for each local area can be a way to achieve that. Got it. That makes sense, especially as I think in relationship to, say, a Google AdWords campaign where you do want your landing page to match the keyword mm -hmm. phrase. So in that example you just mentioned, if someone was searching for Santa Monica Lawn Sprinkler Company, yep. then ideally you would have a page that has that keyword phrase. I'm just thinking out loud here in the meta title and the page title uh, in your H1 and in your content. So when they land on that page, they see in the title perhaps in bold, Santa Monica Lawn Sprinkler Company. And they go, wow, I just found what I was looking for. Let me read this page a little more. Exactly. You're, you're going to be the good fit. If, if all your competitors are just, all their site just says Los Angeles, and you're the one that took the time to create a, a helpful page, it's just about Santa Monica. And maybe talk about, you know, what you've done in Santa Monica. And say same thing like we talked about before, the prices and maybe testimonials from Santa Monica residents you know, really customize and try to provide as much value as you can to the person coming to that page. And that can work really well. And I'll make a bold statement to say that perhaps if you have optimized that page and people found it and they like what they see, they may start to look at that company as long as everything else lines up as a professional, as an expert in that search that they came across. And perhaps you can charge a little bit more for your services because you are now the one that's top of mind to them. They've found you. So I'm always looking for ways that irrigation and landscape companies can add more value and therefore maintain or increase their prices. And this might be a good way to do that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, if someone's searching for landscape services in Los Angeles and you know, they live in Santa Monica and there's 10 results on page one, nine of them just say Los Angeles sprinkler services. One says Santa Monica sprinkler services. That's the one that's probably going to get all the clicks and all the attention. Mm -hmm. Awesome. One thing to note on that though, is let's say you have uh, you know, a few different pages for your, your target cities and towns you're going after. You want to make sure each of them has unique content. You don't want to just copy and paste the exact same thing and swap out the name of the city because Google's kind of caught onto that and they can actually kind of hurt your rankings for doing that. So if you're going to take this approach, it's important to write unique content for each page. Hmm. Okay. Good point. That sounds maybe more like something that you would do in 2006 with Google is have a hundred different pages for a hundred different cities and just swap out with a formula name of city insert here. It used to work really well too. People were <laughs> killing it with that until Google caught on and those people paid the price. Right. And how unique does the content need to be? I mean, you could literally take the content and just do a rewrite. A good writer or yourself could you just basically rewording it um, using different phrases and sentences and, and, and kind of a structure for it. So I think you kind of just approach it as like a fresh article or a fresh piece of content and just refer to, you know, you have your main article that you've written and you're just going to maybe rewrite a few times and change a few things. Uh, depending on what changes with the cities you go after. You know, is there any challenges in certain areas? Is there different types of customers in certain areas? Is, you know, who you're speaking to going to be different if you're you know, having a sprinkler supply in Compton versus sprinkler supply in Beverly Hills? What have you seen, let's say, in the last couple of years in, in terms of websites being penalized or people doing, quote unquote, bad things? Is there anything that comes to mind that are big no-no's? So a big no-no, and you'll see this out there, this is mainly related to link building. So you know, kind of a, taking a step back for a second, the number of backlinks and the authority of those backlinks going to your website is one of the biggest ranking factors in Google. So and when I say authority, if, if you get a link from a site like CNN.com, that has a lot of authority. It's very trusted by Google, and having a link from that can really help your rankings, whereas if I created a blog a week ago and I linked to your website, it's probably not going to have any impact at all. So that's what we mean by authority. So people know that the heart of Google's algorithm is who's linking to who. It's almost like a vote of trust. If a bunch of different websites are linking to somewhere, it's probably because that site provides good information. It's reliable. It's trustworthy. On the flip side, if there's a website that has nobody linking to it, it's really not getting any votes of trust and it's probably not going to rank very well. So what people tried to do is like, okay, well, I hear I need backlinks. 
and let me go find them. And there's services out there that will say, hey, you know, $100 will get you submitted to 50 directories or we'll get you 200 blog comments. Those you want to steer clear of. That's the kind of stuff that got people penalized really hard around 2011, 2012 and can still get someone penalized really hard. And the only type of link building you want is something that's going to be more natural and editorial. If there's any vendors you work with, any partners you have, maybe see if they want to link to you from their website. If there's any you know, members or, or partner or companies, try to get links from there. But you really want to steer clear of sort of any type of bulk auto submission. And if it looks too good to be true, it probably is. Gotcha. So I'm thinking two things. One, I'm going to give you a little bit of credit here because I had forgotten about something that you put into motion for us, which was a scholarship. Mm -hmm. And we basically came up with a question. It was something like, how can a proper horticultural practice increase water use efficiency on a landscape? Something yeah. like that. And we were offering $500 scholarship for a student. And again, I'd forgotten about this. <laughs> and four months later, we started getting these emails and these submissions from college students. I should say all over, you know, we probably had 50 or 70 submissions. Mm -hmm. And then when we ran a search to find our scholarship, well, these professors were posting links on the university websites for their students, you know, linking back to Sprinkler Supply Store and to our scholarship. And we were getting backlinks from .edu domain authority websites. Yeah. And so that little trick right there that you did for us really worked well. And I think we probably ought to do it again. Uh, and I'm not saying every landscaper needs to go do that, <laughs> but it just made me think there's a difference between poor link building practices and proper link building practices. Right. That's exactly it. A lot of link building, it, it kind of falls under the umbrella of regular PR. You know, it's kind of getting your name out there. In, in different varieties, you know, sponsoring something, having a scholarship, maybe you, you write an article for a local blog about, you know, sprinkler repair services or how to prepare for this winter, write that article, include a link back to your website, and that can have a, a good impact on rankings and traffic. Okay. Are there things that a, let's say a local business, because most landscape and irrigation uh, professionals are small local businesses. Should they be watching out for companies? And this may or may not be the right thing, like the yellow pages that have salespeople that call on every business in town and say, we'll build you a website. We're going to get it ranked in Google. Are there things that they should be aware of maybe looking at those companies? So is, is yellow pages doing something like that? Are they? Well, I think they did. And then I think maybe they changed names to like uh, Hebu or Fibu, something like that. And, and I'm not just saying yellow pages. I guess I'd say any local marketing agency mm -hmm. where every town has more and more and more of these quote unquote local marketing agencies that will get you ranked fast and Google will get you more oh, business. The big promises. Right. Yeah. You got to be, you know, you, there's, here's the thing. There, there's no guarantees. If anyone that says we'll get you on page one, we'll get you rank, especially if they say we'll get you ranking number one and they make guarantees, I would not trust someone like that because at the end of the day, you can influence Google all you want, but there are no guarantees. You can do everything right and for whatever reason, they still might rank on your competitors and a, a good SEO would know that and would respect that and wouldn't make any sort of false promises that they actually have no control over. It's like a financial advisor guaranteeing you that you're going to get a, a 10, 20% return. I don't know. That's would be irresponsible and unprofessional. And the same applies for SEO. So if you're trying to hire someone to help you and they're, they're kind of using that type of language, you might want to proceed with caution. Okay. Yeah. Good point. And I appreciate the feedback coming from you because I didn't mention this at the beginning, but you're not on this episode here looking for customers. And frankly, you focus on search engine optimization for e-commerce businesses. And we're just talking fundamentals, but you have no skin in the game to be saying something to try to get somebody listening to buy your services. So I appreciate that honest and open comment. Of course. We, I mean, we got a, a waiting list anyway, so we're not able to take on clients at this time. So this is just raw, unfiltered information to, to help you guys out. Yeah. Where do you think, and there's no right or wrong answer here, where do you think SEO is going? If you were to look out and say in five years from now, how is Google and the search engines different? I think 
this actually comes from an interview I recently had with a guy named Rand Fishkin. Uh, he's the founder of Moz.com, and some people consider him like one of the godfathers of SEO. He's kind of one of the biggest influencers and authorities on the subject of SEO and kind of really pioneered how we do modern day SEO. And I was able to have a one-on-one -on -one interview with him and pick his brain for a while. And what he said is Google's goal is to kind of, instead of just being a search engine, be more of a platform. And instead of sending traffic away to other places, it wants to be that platform in itself. So we're starting to see this more and more where you search a question and it's answering the question for you at the very top of the search results. You don't have to click anywhere. And it's starting to do that with more informational things, but we're also seeing kind of more product searches in Google where you don't, maybe you don't even have to click on an e-commerce site. You're seeing some products right then and there. What I wouldn't be surprised about is if Google starts to do kind of more of this with service companies, you know, who's to say that they can't, you know, you search for Los Angeles landscaping company, who's to say, you know, they're going to kind of highlight the one or the ones that they think are best. And maybe they have like their own service directory. Maybe they're kind of starting to expand their services. So that's a possibility. But as far as just, you know, fundamentals of SEO, I think over time, links is going to be less important. I think the technical issues, because there's a whole side of SEO about technical issues to make sure your crawling is correct and your indexing correct and don't have this in the URL and have that. I think that's going to become less important, especially as more and more people used to easy systems like WordPress. And as Google gets smarter and better at crawling and understanding websites, I don't think the technical side will be as important. And what I think will be the most important is kind of what we touched on earlier, which is how are users interacting with web pages? That's the end all be all. Google wants to rank the best content number one. And the way it can assess that is how are people interacting with that page? So I think that would be the biggest ranking factor is just how good is your content? How well does it answer the query? And are people staying on the page when they visit your website? Right. That interaction. So going back, just a couple comments to the technical SEO, because you said a lot of great things there that we're not going to cover in this podcast, but it made me think, you know, how does the page speed, load speed, like mobile optimization, how do all those things play into Google friendliness? Yeah, well, those are all very important. And, you know, a lot of SEOs will look at it with tunnel vision, like, okay, Google says we need faster pages. So let's go increase our page speed. Google says that we need mobile friendly website. So let's make it mobile friendly. And you're just doing it because Google says so. If you take a step back and look at why you're doing this, all those things improve the user experience. All those things can have people stay on your website longer. If you have a fast loading website, people aren't going to bounce and hit the back button as fast. If your site's mobile friendly, people on a mobile device are going to spend more time on your website and they're not going to hit the back button as fast. So all those things that you're mentioning, sure, it's, it's kind of a staple of technical SEO, but it's all under the overarching umbrella of providing the best user experience as possible so people actually stay on your website. Mm -hmm. Okay. While you were talking there, I ran a quick search to try to demonstrate for myself the, you know, sort of Google serving up the answer to the question right on quote unquote, the platform right in the search results. And so because we're right at the beginning of the coronavirus at this time, I started to type in coronavirus and Google was auto populating for me symptoms. So I said, all right, hit that. And what I'm seeing on the results on the right hand side of my page is coronavirus disease is characterized by mild symptoms, including runny nose, sore throat, that they're providing this information directly on the platform, like you said, mm -hmm. without me clicking anywhere. And as I look at it, it appears to be coming from the number one ranked page. It's pulling the snippet out of rank number one, the CDC, as the authority of this particular search phrase, coronavirus symptoms. Right. They really want to answer that for you. Yeah. So maybe that goes to what you said. If you're a lawn or landscape company and you put some investment on your website and you can get it ranking, this would be a reason to do that now because you maybe want to be in that position where you have the contextual authority so that Google will display your information from your website right on the platform. And here's another good one that's going to be more relevant. Uh, Andy, what I want you to do, and if you're listening, you can do the same thing, is just go into Google and search Los Angeles landscape costs. And you're probably, I want to see if you see the same thing I'm seeing. There's a featured snippet at the top okay. that you don't even have to click on any of the websites. It tells you right 
Oh, look at that. Heck yeah, there's some nice pictures and graphs. So what I'm seeing here at the top of the page is landscaping Los Angeles County costs, bullet point number one, seven to eight dollars per linear foot material cost. And in my mind, I'm thinking, well, for what? I mean, this is such a generalized search phrase. Average labor cost to install, average cost. So it's giving us this information without us clicking onto the website. Yeah. And you know what's good about this is it kind of teasing you a bit. I bet if someone's looking for Los Angeles landscape costs, they're probably going to click the link below to learn more about this. The reason I love these you know, costs keywords, whether it's like landscape costs, sprinkler repair costs, Google shows this type of result for a lot of these cost related keywords. So, you know, going back, if you have a website, I'd highly recommend creating a page just on the costs and you can do one per service and make it pretty comprehensive and solid. And if you can have little visuals, making it easier to understand, then that's great. And you want to really answer the question. And if you do that correctly, you can show up in this type of featured snippet, we call it at the top of page one above everybody else and get the most traffic. And what's good about this is someone searching costs, they're probably almost ready to take out their credit card or, or make a call and purchase. So this is a, a great strategy. Yeah, they're probably middle or bottom of the sales funnel, if you will. So if you're listening and you're thinking, I'm not going to tell anyone my costs. Number one, I don't want my competitors to know. Number two, I want to figure out what the homeowner is willing to spend and craft my proposal based on their needs. But what I'm hearing you say is you can talk about what all the costs are and educate the customer, but not say what your costs are. Just talk about what affects the costs exactly. of an irrigation or, or landscape. And you can even say average costs. You, know, you can kind of control that story too. Yeah, very good. Now, the other thing I was thinking in regards to Google providing this information, do you think it has anything to do with the, I don't know what you call it, but the hello Google, where you're basically asking Google in voice, Google, tell me about landscaping costs in Los Angeles that they can't point you to a bunch of websites mm -hmm. through voice. They're going to basically like answer that question. So do you think this is sort of tied to that? I 100% think so. Uh, in fact, I wouldn't be surprised if this big push that Google made to create these featured snippets was driven by people doing voice search. Like if you search something into Google and it gives you that featured snippet at the top where it answers the question, that's usually the same or very similar to whatever voice answer Google's going to give you. Right. So if you're Mrs. Smith and you're in the kitchen and you're doing some dishes and you go, oh shit, my sprinkler, right, I backed over it yesterday, crap. And you're in a kitchen, you may go, hey Google, give me a sprinkler repair company in Santa Monica. Yeah. If you're that company, that could be you. Right. So maybe, yeah, that's really fascinating. Awesome. Well, maybe this is a good place to end it because from here we could go into all the technicalities and I think leaving it with a little sort of nugget on where the future of SEO could be going gives something for everyone to think about. So is there anything else you think that a lawn or landscape company should consider in regards to SEO? No, I think we pretty much covered all the basics. So you know, if you follow these steps, make sure you, you find good keywords that people are searching for, create pages for them, maybe for each location, each service, uh, then optimize those pages to put the keyword and the content and the title and, the, and then on the, on the page itself. And most importantly, like what we talked about, just make sure it provides the best user experience possible. Make sure it really answers whatever question they have in their head. And I'm sure just being on phone calls, you know what your customers are looking for. You know what questions come up. Answer those on the page so they're just that much more likely to, to call you instead of hitting the back button and looking at one of your competitors. Yeah, that's great. And maybe if that page is good enough, it would be something you'd want to send to your clients as part of the sales process. If you're curious about why a landscape irrigation systems, why the cost could be so different. Let me send you this link to our website where you can learn about that. So if it's good enough to want to share with somebody, it's got to be good enough for Google. Exactly. And the funny thing about this, we all looked at this from a lens of do these things so you can rank higher in Google. Well, if you do these things and have really good, helpful pages, that's going to increase your leads too. You're going to get more people calling your website, fewer people jumping off your website. So not only can you get more traffic, but you'll probably get more leads from that traffic. Awesome. Jeff, well, thanks so much. If somebody wants to reach out to you, even though you're not taking new <laughs> clients, how can they learn more about your company or reach out to your company? Our website is 180marketing.com. And then my email is just jeff at 180marketing.com. 
Awesome. Well, thanks so much for sharing all this information and I uh, really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Andy. You got it. Cheers. Take care. That was very informative. Thanks so much for joining us today, guys. I hope that wasn't too technical. I tried to keep Jeff talking more on the fundamentals and strategy and less in the weeds of technical SEO since I don't expect any of you guys to jump in and be SEO experts, but I do think it would be nice for you to have some education and some background. So if you are going to hire a marketing agency or a local company to help you, that you've got some fundamentals on your side so that you can understand the differences between maybe firm A and firm B or firm C and some of the prices and strategies that they may use to help you with your search engine optimization and your website. So I have a couple key takeaways. Number one, I like how Jeff was talking about understanding what your customers are searching for, understand what they're looking for, understand the type of content that you need to present to them. So when they land on the page that they've found, they want to stick around. They want to go to page two and page three and not just bounce back. Jeff mentioned using a tool called Uber Suggest to find out some of those search phrases. And then he also mentioned using the word cost, which I thought was really interesting, or perhaps the word price. So you could build a page called Santa Monica Landscaping Prices or Santa Monica Sprinkler Prices and build an educational page that talks about the differences between maybe a low-priced sprinkler system and a high-priced sprinkler system and everything in between. And that would help keep the user on the page. And it may also be a page of your website that you can use as a reference. So when you're bidding and proposing and presenting to homeowners and they have these types of questions, you may be able to say, hey, Mrs. Smith, we've got a lot of information about this on our website. Let me send it over to you. And you can read all about the differences in pricing between landscape and irrigation contractors. So I think that's going to wrap it up for today. I would certainly love to hear from you. Like I've mentioned before, sometimes I feel like I'm speaking into a one-way microphone and I would love to hear from you. Feel free to reach out to me directly. My email is andy at sprinklernerd.com. Love to know who you are, where you live, what you do for a living, whether you're in the landscape or irrigation business, or maybe you're just a homeowner, or maybe you work for a city or a municipality. I would love to hear from you, so don't hesitate to reach out. And I think, uh, yeah, I think that's going to wrap it up. So until the next episode, happy sprinkling, and we'll talk to you then. Mm-hmm.